Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the Managing Director, North America Financial Services from Accenture, Michael Abbott. Thank you, everyone, and, and, and welcome. It's great to see everyone here today. Um, you know, before I spend time sharing with you the results of our most recent uh, payment survey, I'd like to just give you a short video that summarizes what we found out. So if uh, you guys could play the video. All right, if that didn't wake you up, I don't know what will. <laughs> this summer, we surveyed about 4,000 consumers in North America to understand what their, their interest, awareness, and adoption of mobile payments uh, and payments in general were. Basically, what we wanted to do is we wanted to find out what does payments feel like in 2020 to the man on the street. And here's what we found. Cash may be king, but increasingly, the king remains folded up in our wallets. Second. Mobile payments have hit a tipping point here. More than half the population now is aware that they can pay with their mobile phone at the point of sale. Awareness is no longer a problem in mobile payments at all. About a third of us, a little north of a third of us, report that we are willing to try anything at this point in time. We've all become, to some extent, early adopters of technology. And surprisingly, a very large percentage of us are willing to share our online bank credentials with a third party. This may be surprising to some of you, but trust is the foundation now of our connected economy. Almost every single one of us now check our online balance weekly through either a mobile app or our PC desktop. We're constantly connected to our financial, our financial life. But two-thirds of us view our banking relationship as purely transactional, there's clearly an opportunity to do something more here. We should expect, based on the survey results, mobile payments to increase 50% over the next four years. And interestingly enough, it will be millennials that lead the charge on this. 30%, almost a third of millennials today report that they're willing to make and they want to make a payment at the point of sale using a wearable device. And we saw, again, a double-digit increase in people shopping directly on their mobile phones from 2015 to 2016. And almost half of us now use our mobile phone to pay someone else, either through an app or through an online site. 
That was going really well until somebody brought the skunk to the mobile payments picnic. You're not reading this slide wrong. We saw no increase year over year in the usage of mobile payments from 2015 to 2016. So we wanted to understand a little bit more what was going on, what's happening here? Why aren't consumers adopting mobile payments? And here's what we found. Was it acceptance? No, surprisingly, even though merchant acceptance is still building at this point in time, consumers don't view acceptance as the barrier to making a payment at the point of sale using their phone. Is it awareness? Clearly not, even from the survey results we saw before. Is it privacy? Privacy, not a major factor in not paying at the point of sale. How about security? Security used to be about 60 to 70 percent of the people would say they wouldn't make a mobile payments because of security fears. That has dropped down to in the 20s now, and it continues to drop. The issue is value. The challenge with mobile payments today is it's kind of like it's like playing an Atari game on an Xbox. It's functional, but it leaves you wanting a lot more than what you can do today. So we went out there and we asked. We said, well. Consumers, who would you trust to provide you more in the mobile payment space? And what we found was we found it's anyone's game that can win. Consumers are willing to trust large banks. They're willing to trust alternative payment providers. They're just simply looking for someone to provide them more than what they have today. So we dug into the ecosystem. We went out there and we said, well, let's take a look and see if there are people who are providing more who are providing that value. And here's what we found. When you take a look at what Google's doing today with the technology they acquired for SoftCard, we think they are on the verge of creating the equivalent of a Visa MasterCard network for the delivery of offers and loyalty. All you need to do is take a look at what they did with Walgreens to get a glimpse of what the future may look like in that space. You know, equally transformative, you can see, is what Apple has done with online checkout. The ability now to check out online on a web page with just simply a touch of your thumb. Just imagine the day when we no longer have to memorize 100 different user IDs and passwords at different websites. That's transformative. And what Visa and MasterCard have done with tokenization the APIs they provided has allowed all of us to take pretty much any card, put it into any wallet, anywhere in the world. What's happening here is the winners in this space have found a way to open up their platforms to allow others to innovate on behalf of them. And the question for the financial institutions and the banks is, are they going to be a utility to this emerging ecosystem? Or are they ultimately going to evolve to become a platform for commerce? We estimate the opportunity in the mobile wallet space, and in particular in connected commerce, to be north of $50 billion. This is a tremendous opportunity. So how do we get there? First, the first thing you have to realize is payments are not broken. This is all about commerce. And in particular, it's about connected commerce. Um, I was watching John Scully earlier this week, and he, uh, he made a great point. He said, look, linear thinking is dead. It's all about exponential thinking. And for us to make the opportunity happen here, we have to think exponentially. And for, I believe that means four things. One, we need to design for emotion. We need to move beyond transactional thinking to designing for value-based outcomes. And you can take a look at the work we just did, you saw it in the video too, around money mindsets. It's a great way to get started on that front. Second, we need to think open. So, and what that means, we need to figure out is how do we open up our platforms to let others innovate on that? Walled gardens are not going to win this game anymore. All you have to do is take a good hard look at what's happening with PSD2 in Europe to understand and get a glimpse of what the future is going to look like here. And then third, we need to collaborate and coordinate more. This is not a winner-take-all game. Right? We're only going to win if we work together on this. And we have to build for scale. And what that means, that means two things. One, it means standards. We should be asking ourselves not what the future of payments looks like now, but we should be asking ourselves what's going to become, what's going to be the equivalent of the mag stripe for the delivery of offers and loyalty. Second, it means we have to think about the business models differently. 
The fixed pricing model that's dominated the payments industry has to change. We need to think about this in terms of marketplace pricing. So when I look at all of this, I think we're at an inflection point. I think we're at an inflection point similar to the 1960s when the merchants and banks in this country got together and formed the foundation of what is the great payment system we have today. You know, this is a huge opportunity. The time is now. And if you want to learn more about what we're doing to make this happen, give us a call. Thank you.